thank you every, everyone for turning up and a very good evening a very good rain eve evening um so uh we are here to hear from a very important and distinguished speaker professor david seemly um the context of this talk is about the northeast and northeast has been in the news of late for a host of reasons and i think that a lot of reactions that come about to the region are mostly half baked and are ill informed and they are the fact that they are uh, they remain so is because of a lack of understanding of the socio political and geographical com complexities of the region uh, the history that it carries the uh, the sociological aspects of that particular region and it's important to con contextualize them in a proper historical context the fact that we view the northeast with a particular lens is often borne by the fact that it is often framed by certain historical um uh, events most notably uh, beginning from the colonial pe um colonial era so in that context i feel that uh, this talk will shed some very Im important light as to how has the northeast the uh political lens of the northeast been actually framed so uh, i'll just give a brief abstract of the talk and um i'll bring my student pelo to introduce to formally introduce the talk um so we are here to talk about uh the 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 plan that fell through crown colony for the hills of northeast india concept to collapse from 1941 till 1946 it's based on this book the edge of empire the four secret plans for northeast india um in the closing years of the british rule a secret plan was conceived and discussed at the highest circles for a crown colony comprising the hills of the northeast and the tribal and in indigenous areas of burma the plan was not implemented largely because it came up for discussion in the last years of the imperial rule this plan has been referred to in many publications without having access to the actual texts in 2014 sage india published on the on uh, on the edge of empire four secret plans for northeast india this book includes the confidential notes of two assam governors sir robert reed and sir andrew g clow and two ics officers of the of the assam ad administration james p mills and philip f adam the administrative pattern of the hill areas of the region before independence and their thoughts for for administration following the transfer of power to india an overview by the author largely drawn from the from the archival records related to the crown colony plan forms forms the introduction of the book today's lecture the plan that fell through crown colony for the hills of northeast india concept to collapse 1941 to 1946 intends to provide a historical account of this little known plan with that i invite my student velo to formally inaugurate the lecture hello and good evening everyone welcome to a special insight series lecture hosted by the humanities and social sciences department at iit gandhinagar the insight series lectures began in 2022 by professor ashish khaka with a focus on development and indigenous people's issues previous luminaries who have graced the lecture include p sainat professor rashid khalidi professor mahmud mamdani professor edgar nansono and professor terry canon today we are very fortunate to have with us professor david simley from shillong in our midst professor david simley obtained his phd in history from the department of history Northeastern Hill University in Nehu in 1985 he taught at St Edmund's College Shillong from 1977 to 1979 and at Nehu from 1979 to 2012 where he was the head of the department of history controller of examinations officiated as registrar and pro vice chancellor his main areas of interest are christianity in the northeast imperialism colonial colonial policy and practice some of his most acclaimed books are british administration in meghalaya policy and pattern published in 1989 survey of research in history on northeast india 
1970 to 1990, published in 2000. On the Edge of Empire, Four Secret Plans for Northeast India, published in 2014. Layers of History, Essays on Kasi's Gentias, published in 2015. And Faith and Hope, Christian Mission and Churches in Northeast India, 2020. Apart from this, he is also credited with discovering the date of death and other details of the last days of Tirot Singh, the Kasi chief of Nongklaw, who resisted British colonial expansion and discovering the grave of Thomas Johns in Calcutta, who was the first Welsh missionary in the Kasi Hills. He is a recipient of the Charles Wallace Grant for Research in the UK, India-France Cultural Exchange for Research in Paris, and the Senior Fulbright Fellowship for Research in the US. He was also affiliated with Notre Dame University in Indiana, US. Professor Simley was the president of the Northeast India History Association from 2010 to 11. As sectional president of the Modern India Section of Indian History Congress, he delivered his address at the 73rd session held in Mumbai in 2012. He was also the honorary director of the Indian Council of Social Science Research, Northeastern Regional Center. He was appointed as the Vice Chancellor of Rajiv Gandhi University, Arunachal Pradesh in October 2011. In 2012, he was appointed by the President of India as a member of the Union Public Service Commission, Delhi. And on 4 January 2017, he was appointed as the Chairman of UPSC. Since retiring in, in January 2018, he continues to deliver lectures, mentor students, and conduct research. Today, he will be talking to us about a very important topic of the plan that fell through, Crown Colony for the Hills of Northeast India, Concept to Collapse, 1941 to 1946. Please join in with me in welcoming Professor Semle to IIT Gandhinagar. Let's all clap and welcome him. Professor Simley, the floor is yours. Dear Professor Ashish, Thank you for inviting me to IIT Gandhinagar because this is an IIT and uh, this is not an association where you know you have crowds like the Indian History Congress where there's a tussle for reading out one's paper in the five minutes. I remember going to one of the Indian History Congress sessions in Delhi and uh, I had just time enough to say my name the title of the paper, and there was a thank you. Uh, but bet between me and somebody else, uh, the other person was more, a more renowned historian and got 20 minutes. I thought that was unfair. But please hold on while I speak on a topic which is of tremendous passion for me. I had first work on the Crown Colony a small section of my PhD submitted in 1985 to Nehu. I had collected material from Teen Murti, from uh, India Office Library London, and from various other libraries in the region. And it gave me an idea that I should develop that further. But it was a good 10 years before On the Edge of Empire was published in 19, uh, 2014 by Sage. Unfortunately, even if you want a copy of it, you will have to read it from the library rather than acquire a copy of it because Sage has discontinued its book publishing. But you could get a Kindle version of it and uh, I will allow you, I will look the other way. A little bit on the title of the work, On the Edge of Empire. A title of a book is extremely important for readers to capture the sense in the briefest form of what the book is about. And I thought I should call it On the Edge of Empire because the book relates to the end of empire in time and both space, 1941 to 1946, which were the closing years of British imperialism in India and the breakup of empire, including the Northeast. In 2012, Sage India published On the Edge of Empire Four British Plans for Northeast India. These were confidential notes of two Assam governors, Sir Robert Reed and Sir Andrew Clow, and two ICS officers of the Assam administration, James P. Mills, 
a renowned anthropologist, and his successor, Philip F. Adams. They wrote on the proposal for administrating the hill areas of the region before and after independence. The book has a long introduction by me. This formed the text of the book. The reviews soon after the publication were both impressive and uh, uh, were both um, appreciative and critical. I like the critical part of it. And uh, one of the things that I did was I took the Hindu's uh, caption for the review. I can't, can't tell you who the author of that review was, but he called it the plan that fell through. So I culled that and brought it into today's lecture. That's not, is it? It's okay. Shweta has done a marvelous job of doing a PowerPoint presentation. There's a huge difference, however, in the brevity of the PowerPoint presentation and my longer version. So I will read it out and Shweta will be making, uh, shifting the pages. The purpose of making this shorter version of the title of the book is to situate the hill areas of the Northeast. Shortly, before the transfer of power in 1947 and prior to the process of integrating the hill region into the Indian Union. In doing so, it will partly answer why the integration of some of the hill districts into Assam and India was not as smooth as might have been desired. Further, it suggests that the neglect to consider several British options on the future and demarcation of the hill areas into an independent India was in part the Assam problem in its relation with the Hill people. I notice very sadly that the four plans were not taken up at all by the new Indian administration in 1946-47. They were shelved and uh, shelved to the extent that there were only rumors of what the plan was without the detail. And one crazy uh, historian without any source of the the plans which are being presented today said there was a Christian conspiracy. I mean, and uh, it, it might delight many today to go back to the Christian conspiracy. Were there any conspiracy at all? I find nothing of it. This presentation makes no attempt to support or advocate the crown colony, only that it had in it, they, it, had in it a feeble uh, and ill, it was a feeble and ill timed bid to do something for the political future of the Hill people. Let's go to Reed's plan. Oddly enough, the first people who Reed announced the plan to soon after it was published by the publication division of the printing press in Shillong were school children at the Welsh Mission Girls High School in Shillong on 13th November, 1941. Recording in progress. They told the audience, the children, their parents, teachers, and guests that India was on the threshold of great change. And I will quote, where do you come into this picture? He asked his audience, largely school girls, surely did not know what to answer. He then went on to say, it may be, it is no new thought, but it has been canvassed in the press often enough that the destiny of these hills and other areas of Assam will follow another course than that of being linked with those of India proper. It may be otherwise, but sooner or later, the question is going to be conversed and the decision will depend in great measure on public support, on public support. He did not get public support because he did not approach the public. It was a confidential plan right through 1941 to 1946. What motivated Reed to write a note on the future of the present excluded, partially excluded and tribal areas of Assam? There were three areas of the hill areas which were categorized by the Government of India Act 1935. Excluded areas, partially excluded areas and tribal areas. The excluded areas were the Naga Hills and the Lushai Hills. The partially excluded area were the Khasi Jayanti and the Garu Hills, including the Mikir Hills. And you had a small tribal area 
an area between the uh, Nagaland and Burma known as the tribal areas. For some weird reason, these er this area was called the unadministered area. Unadministered by the British, yes, but administered by the people themselves. The British did not come down to that level of understanding that the tribes were man managing their own affairs. But for the British, well, it was unadministered. Very sad interpretation. That he wrote it after traveling around the province of his charge, meeting deputations of tribal leaders, consulting the deputy district deputy commissioners and the officials in the Assam administration, there is no doubt. And if one wants to read up further on Sir Robert Reed, one could go into his biography, Years of Change in Bengal and Assam. It's a delightful text, and I would urge anybody who wishes to follow this lecture to go to Reed's uh, biography. A hint comes in the very first paragraph where he writes, the identity of the countries with which they march and their importance from the point of view of strategy and international politics are factors which cannot be overlooked. A footnote to this opinion clarified that in his mind, and I quote again, problems arising of this, out of the Sino-Japanese War and the World War of 1939 have underlined the importance of the Northeast in its, in its relations with Tibet, China, Burma, and Japan. It's, under, it's easy to understand why Tibet, China, and Burma, because these were territories that abutted on British India, but he also includes Japan. And uh, it was Japan in 1942, as you know, that came close to the frontiers of India, uh, a history that is well documented. As a build-up to his plan, Reed reviewed the pattern of administration of the excluded areas, the partially excluded areas, and the unadministered tracts between India and Burma, that is before the Government of India Act 1935. He drew much from the memoranda of N. E. Pari, who had earlier been Deputy Commissioner of the Garu Hills and later Superintendent of the Lusai Hills and Dr. John H. Hutton, for many years Deputy Commissioner of the Naga Hills, who wrote in the Indian Statutory Commission Report of 1930. Hutton's view, and this is important, was that the Hill people were racially, historically, culturally, and linguistically different from the people of the plains of Assam, while the administration was wholly on different lines. Both he and Perry had suggested to the commission the formation of a northeastern frontier province to comprise of as many of the backward tracts of Assam and Burma as could be conveniently included in it. So what Reed does is taking the cue from any Pari and uh, Hutton, changes the idea of a northeast frontier province into a crown colony. Reed believed the boundary between India and Burma, which only in 1935 was separated and from Indian administration, was artificial as it is imperceptible. Reed revived Hutton's plan of a northeast frontier agency, province or agency, embracing the entire hill fringe from the Lushai Hills and Lakher land in the south in a crescent shape round to the hills of present-day Arunachal Pradesh including Chittagong Hill tracks, including the Naga Hills, also including the Chins of Burma and the Shan State in Burma. Also considered for inclusion were the 25 Khasi states and Manipur, and the unadministered territory of which I've made mention. He estimated that the population of the agency excluding the hill areas of Burma would be two and a half million. The most significant departure of Reed over Hutton's plan was that while the latter proposed the Northeast province or agency would be administered by India, Governor Reed wrote, and I would quote, that he would put this under a chief commissioner and he in turn would, I, ima I imagine, have to be divorced as is Burma from the control of the government of India and put under some appropriate department at Whitehall. So he's talking about 
changing the plan of Hutton under the Indian administration to an administration administered by Britain from Whitehall. He visualized that the form of polity would be in, on self-governing lines in the way outlined in Hutton's note of 17th March, 1928. This was a note sent to the Simon Commission. Institutions of this kind in the plains are as good as dead, he wrote, but in the tribal areas, they are untouched and working. And I continue. Elders or chiefs and their advisors settle the vast majority of disputes. Villages have their own funds and village roads and bridges are kept by communal unpaid labor. Each village is a self-governing unit, but there are unmistakable signs of willingness to combine into larger units. The Lushai Hills have the nucleus for this. One must appreciate that all four of the plans, which I'm now taking up first with Reed, have an appreciation of the tribal administering themselves in indirect administration, in what was called indirect administration, or for the British, a paternal form of administration. He admitted finance would be difficult as these hills, except the Jayanti hills, were deficit areas. Were the scheme to take effect, he continued, this agency would have to draw finance from imperial sources, for which there were precedents in the history of crown colonies. And I mentioned Swaziland and Basuto land in a different note of mine. Uh, this, these, there was precedent for, for the imperial sources financing the crown colonies, as was done in, in Africa. The proposed province read suggested could be manned by an expanded Burma frontier service, not an Indian civil service, but a Burma frontier service. The amount of control would undoubtedly have to be very considerable for a time, but it is essential, he said, that it should come from Whitehall and not from India, to which the hill tracks are entirely alien. Reed admitted that he had drawn up, what he had drawn up was only a tentative proposal in broad outline for which much detail would have to be filled in. But supposing it was decided, he said, for whatever reason that the scheme he had outlined were impractic impracticable, he trusted that he had sufficiently explained that to place the hills under the control of an Assam ministry was impossible and unworkable. Placing it under Assam was unworkable and impossible. We'll see a similar line of thought coming from Mills. Copies of the confidential notes soon reached Sir uh, Lord Linlithgow, the Viceroy, and L.S. Emery, the Secretary of State for India. The latter was so impressed with the plan that he gave a copy to Professor Reginald Copeland, who used it in his third and final volume on the constitutional problem in India. Was there a problem? I mean, uh, title again title again. I mean, these are aspirations, but it's looked upon as a problem. Anyway, um, the name of the book was The Future of India, Oxford University Press, London, 1943. And what I found was the note, Reed's note that went from Lord Lindlithgow and L.S. Emery to Reginald Coupland, who used it in his third volume on the cost constitutional problem in India, and it is mistakenly credit, who is mistakenly credit with changing a private and confidential report into a scheme that took his name. In some books, which don't even follow Reginald Coupland's text, nor the plans which I'm reading out today, uh, they refer to it not as the Reed plan, but as the Coupland plan, simply on the basis of one document, which was the future of India. When asked for their views, the opinion of the Burma administration then housed in Shimla. In 1942, the British evacuated Burma and uh, they were housed in a hotel in Shimla. When asked for their views, the opinion of the Burma administration then housed in Shimla following the evacuation from Burma was divided. 
H.J. Mitchell, the chairman of the Commission on Scheduled Areas of Burma, was not in support of Reed's plan. His personal views influenced the Burma administration. However, it did not influence the governor, uh, as we shall presently see. And this is interesting. The plan was discussed by LSA Mary and Lord Wavell shortly before the latter left England to take charge as Governor General of India. And also it was discussed with Sir Reginald Dormand Smith, Governor of Burma, then in London to discuss Burma's future. Wavell sometime later saw Reginald Dormand Smith in Shimla and discussed a number of points with him. The most important was the governor's idea that the tribal areas of Burma, Assam, and possibly Bengal should be formed into a separate unit and administered by the governor general or by the governor of Burma. So you see, there was a, a further development now including certain areas of Bengal into the uh, colony or the protectorate. Um, this was at the very highest levels of administration in London. Shortly thereafter, Wavell was credited with taking home in 1945, a plan for a province to be solely ruled by Britain. And this I get from Nicholas Manserg, the transfer of power volume five, which is a wonderful collection of documents on the transfer of power uh, between 1941 and 1947. Meanwhile, discussions through 1943-46 on the question of administrative amalgamation on the Burma and tribal areas was underway. A matter of concern was the readjustment of the frontier between Burma and India and the tribal areas and the desirability of some system of coordination of administration. It is sad that people uh, of, a, of a similar tribe are separated between Burma and India. India did not give serious consideration to this between 1941 to 1947. Neither did the British when they handed over Burma for its independence in 1948. But at one point of time, there was a talk on administrative amalgamation. Representatives of the Burma administration viewed that distinct tribes should generally not be divided into two administrations, not be divided into two administrations, and the boundaries should be drawn on to bring as far as possible the whole of a tribe under the government, which already had included in its territory the majority of a tribe. And I'm looking at Tongi. You're doing a work on something of what I'm saying. So you could follow up this lead. Uh, uh, it will it, stimulate your thought on the amalgamation. Reed's belief that the plan he he had revived would be canvassed was, however, limited to discussions between the officials of the India Office Library, India Office, London, and Burma Public, uh, and Burma. I'm having a little problem. I have a little eyesight, eye problem, and the, the vision is getting blurred. Uh, my sebaceous glands are uh, leaking out and very often it looks as if I'm crying, but I'm not. I'm delighted to be here. Reed's belief that the plans he had revived would be canvassed was, however, limited to discussions between the officials of the India office, London, India, and Burma. Public support, which apparently was not sought, meant that the plan did not percolate to the people who would have been affected were the plan implemented. Some tribal leaders did get wind of the plan. Reverend J.G.M. Nichols Roy, a member of the Constituent Assembly and member of the, representing the Kasi Hills in the Assam legislature, submitted a memoranda to the British cabinet mission in which he categorically stated that the protectorate would not be viable. And he writes, when the whole of India will get independence, the hill people of Assam should get their own share of independence and they should be connected with the pro province of Assam. So he projects the view that the Kasi and the Jantia people should be brought in under an Assam administration. Another clergyman thought differently, Reverend 
L. Gutfo, representing the Jayanti Hills, hoped his hills would would come would come into the protectorate. Three Garos wrote to the British parliamentary delegation in February 1946, saying that they had heard rumors that a plan was considerable considering was being considered to exclude the Garo Hills from Assam and India. They opposed the plan. Naga's meeting in Kohima in early 1945 asked to remain under the British colony with their own legislative council. The Mizos of the Lushai Hills voiced their own disapproval of the plan. They favored autonomous status for the Lushai Hills within the province of Assam. Now to move to Sir, uh, Governor Andrew Clough. In terms of date of the plans, Mill's report comes before Clough. And not that I'm trying to link up one governor with another and to give them the respect because they are human beings just like anybody else. Uh, I, I, I just thought that I should put Mills a little later to give uh, some variation between the flow of thought of Reed, Clough, and Mills. To now move on to Sir Andrew Clough. While the tribal leaders in the hill areas were getting increasingly drawn into discussions on the future status of their hills, Reed's successor, Andrew Clough, the last British governor of Assam, published in October 1945, The Future Government of Assam, Tribal People. Note the difference in the title of the notes. The Future Government of Assam, Tribal People. Prepared between October 19 and March and uh, March and October 1945, the memorandum demolished Reed's proposal, first by suggesting alterations in hill area administration, and secondly, by giving his personal view on the matter. He made it clear that the time was not opportune for such a proposal. It seems almost likely that a British government which is prepared to set India and Burma on self-governing footing should now undertake the administrative and financial responsibility for a patchwork of sparsely populated hills lying where these hills do. Indian opinion would be equally strong, opposed, equally, uh, equally strongly opposed to the constitution of a foreign territory within its natural boundaries. To ask an Indian government to contribute towards the maintenance of the amputated member would be regarded as adding insult to injury. Clough preferred to a merger of the hills and plains of Assam in a manner which would conserve tribal rights. So what Clough is thinking is, he's after demolishing Reed's plan, he wants the hill areas to be brought under an Assam administration. The last paragraph of, governor, of the governor's memoranda sums up this thought on the matter, and I will read, it's, it's a rather long uh, quotation. Assam is never likely to be a, as homogeneous as other provinces, and it will never remain homogeneous even today. The plains people are not so divided as those of the hills, but they are far from being a single people such as can be found in many equally large or larger parts of India. But this great collection of people in hills and plains have been set in a particular well-demarcated corner of the world, and their welfare will depend on their proving able to live together, being able to live together. Assam should look to her diversity and to her capacity for toleration, which is greater than that of other provinces, to provide her strength. This is a very brief presentation of Andrew Clough's um, views. And very recently, um, I was able to read up Colin R. Alexander, Administering Colonialism and War, The Political Life of Sir Andrew Clough by the Indian Civil Service, written by the great-great-grand-nephew of Andrew Clough. I was dismayed to find very little on the Crown Colony, and uh, it's pretty irrelevant the, the way Al Alexander 
Alexander has made his presentation. But I must tell you, as I did yesterday, how I got Andrew Clough's note. We historians have the ability to sniff and to find and to dig up and to unearth and then to piece together into an account which uh, is intelligible enough. I went to one of the libraries in Delhi to search for Andrew Clough's book and I got it. A wonderful red copy, rebound again after many years of almost being tattered and used by many scholars. And I asked for it to be photocopied. I was denied the photocopy other than one third of the book, which I got photocopied immediately, paid the money, and my mind worked very fast because a colleague of mine was going to Delhi two weeks later, and I gave the reference of that book, and the next one third was photocopied. A year later, a research scholar was going to the same library to do research and completed the collection. We did not viol violate any rule, let me tell you, because when you are historians and you have to get the material and you have to use it for your text, you will find means how to do it, and I did so. Now to move to Mills. James P. Mills, advisor to the governor of Assam for both governors Reed and Clough, was also at work to settle the issue regarding the Hill Area Administration. He too published in 1945 a small but very concise tract, a note on the future of the Hill tribes of Assam and the adjoining hills in a self-governing India. Please note, there's a change now in a self-governing India because by 1945, it was well set that Britain would be leaving India. After reviewing the indigenous tribal administrative systems, the historical background, the racial and cultural setting and other related matters, he put down his views of the possible alternatives of the relationship between the hills and the plains of Assam. He ruled out that it was in the best interest of the hill tribals to be included in Assam at variance with Andrew Clough, as has been noted. An alternative ap appeared to him to be a choice between the two extremes of excluding only some of the tribal areas and to including only the partially excluded areas. Another alternative was to temporarily extend all the hills of Assam with special treatment designed on the lines of indirect rule. To develop these institutions, which still survive, and to fit the tribals for eventual union with the province of Assam. Eventually, eventual union with the province of Assam. If the hills were to be separated from the plains, Mills continued, the two alter alternatives were either to form a province composed of districts, frontiers, tracts, agencies, and states, or to form a union of states from the outset. He strongly favored the second alternative, giving some outline to the scheme he suggested that homogeneous areas could be termed states, such as the Abor state. The Abors are the, the old term for the Nishis living in central part of Arunachal. And just listen carefully to the other suggestions he gives. He wanted an Abor state governing all the tribes included under the term, a Lushai state, a Naga state, a Khasi state, which interestingly would include the Garos and the Jaintias. Within this union of states would be sub-states, a term borrowed from the Burma context, where small or intermingled tribes had been combined into a single sub-state. And it's very interesting that as early as 1945, here was Mills writing in the governor's house, looking far, far ahead at the emergence of states to be because the Boros, Abor state has become, I'm asking, Arunachal, part of Arunachal. The Naga state has become Nagaland. The Lushai state has become Mizoram. And the Khasi state has become part of Meghalaya. So as early as 1946, you have, and I've not seen it being used anywhere in documentation of this very encouraging 
note of Mills in 1945. Full use could be made of existing customs and institutions such as the village council by keeping power in ordinary affairs as local as possible. He was an anthropologist, please note. With regards to staff, each state would require a political officer with an additional political officer in the largest states. Two officers with the status of commissioner for the charge north and north and the south of the Brahmavutra could oversee the administration. And I have underlined this section, the object of the administration being to guide rather than to govern, to guide rather than to govern. Mills wanted the administrative staff to be as small as possible. In line with the principle of paternal administration, the aim he believed ought to be indirect rule rather than administration. So for several reasons, Mills ruled out, ruled out Shillong as the possible cap capital of the Union of States, including the possibility of Shillong remaining the capital of the province of Assam and the difficulty of having an airstrip nearby. He preferred Imphal. Uh, Imphal appeared to him to be to offer better uh, advantages. From there, the states could be reached by air. Tripura and Sikkim, if included, could be reached with equal ease. The only problem with Sikkim, I find, was there is a geographical space between Sikkim and Northeast India. In in the in one of his footnotes, uh, read does mention a possibility of Sikkim coming into the crown colony, but he does not include that stretch of territory, which is Bengal, uh, linking up North Bengal with Assam. And this situation continues today. Sikkim is part of Northeast India, not so much geographically because, uh, uh, and, and culturally, because there's a big difference between Sikkim and Northeast India but for administrative and political reasons. Let's move to Adam, uh, Adam's note. Though the talk had placed 1946 as the close of the Crown Colony plan, it may be of interest to include the views of another officer. Philip Francis Adams arrived in India as a young ICS officer on 14th February, 14th December 1940s, 1937, and it was amongst the last of that cadre of officers recruited for service in India. Adams was for several months before, the, before he demitted office, advisor to the governor of Assam, a position he filled after Mills put in his papers. We may assume that it was while he was in this office and perhaps working on the same table that Adams wrote and here again, please note, note on, the, on a policy for the hill tribes of Assam. Note on a policy for the hill tribes of Assam. The 19-page tract was printed on 5th August 1947, 10 days before India's independence, by which date Ad, uh, Adams had resigned from service. I could not follow up his career, but I believe he went to Tanganyika in Africa to continue serving in the colonial office. Adam's note is quite different than Reed, Mills, and Clough, for he does not go into any detail and makes little reference to any one of the Hill people. In this delightful and insightful note, he sums up much of what the policy for the Hill tribes should be. He makes no reference to the other three notes. He writes, in his introduction that the future of the backward people, this is a derogatory term. The British use very strong and derogatory terms, backward. And I do, I have in my collection a, uh, a note from the Jaintias being uh, very sorry that they are being called backward people. He writes in his introduction that the future of the backward people, and I put it in quotation because it's not my thought, including the tribes of the Northeast, had suffered considerably from the lack of any coordinated and consistent policy towards them. In the absence of any central authority, please note he's now talking not of Assam, but a central authority over them, the policy towards these people had been left to the provinces concerned. 
The consequences, according to him, was that they received somewhat sporadic attention, being overwhelmed by other political and administrative questions. So what Adams is trying to impress on just before he demits office is that there is no real uh, clear policy by the Assam government or by the government of India regarding their administration and their future. Adam observed that the tribes of Assam are a distinct racial stock and they in no way formed a cohesive political unit. So he did not believe that they formed a pol political uh, unit. To this situation was the reality that all the hill districts were deficit areas and were in no position to manage the cost of administration. Surrounded as they were by dominant neighbors, Adam believed that it would be impracticable, even if desirable by some sections, to establish the hills as independent areas. To his, to his mind, union of the hills with Burma was impractical, other than those contiguous to that frontier. He must have been thinking about the Chins, the Kukis, and the, the Nagas making a comment like this. Communication was linked with India. This is a very short sentence, but it had tremendous impact. Communication was linked with India. Moreover, Burma was not in all, in all likelihood would not in all likelihood take on the responsibility to bear the cost of the administration of these hills. Adams was very practical. By the time he wrote his note, preparations were on for the transfer of power from Britain to India. Everything seems to point to the conclusion that the union is linked. Union or linkage must be with India, he wrote. And like Clough, he suggested that the arrangement be made to allow the cultural and racial differences of these areas with those of the plains within a framework of political unity. He must have kept in mind over here Gopinath Bordoloi's committee report, because at that point of time, the Constituent Assembly was working and Gopinath Bordoloi had made a visit to the Lushai Hills. And he, he writes, it is with India that their ultimate union must be. Adams was of the opinion that the hill communi communities should be integrated with the province of Assam and that the center coordinate policy. Here again, he stresses the coordination of policy by the center. Adams appeared to have had an idea of the social problem of tribal societies undergoing change and the need to have a study of the communities before policy be implemented. He was of the opinion that as long as the administration lacked detailed knowledge of communities, the administration could do little more than guide, than guide its main lines of development. Conclusion. Meanwhile, Reginald Dorman Smith, governor of Burma, despite the advice of his officers, continued to be drawn to the plan and admitted in a very uh, interesting note, are flirting with the Reed idea of a separate agency for the Burma Assam frontier. I use these words, sometimes I use my text to put the topics of my papers that are right. And drawing from Dorman Smith's flirting with the Reed plan, I wrote a paper in a very fine volume in memory of a great political scientist um, Venketa Rao, who taught in uh, Guwahati and uh, at Nehu. There's a very, he was a dear person, Venketa Rao. He, want, he taught in Nehu for about 10 years without pay, without any money. He was a bachelor, and just before his death, he called me. He said, David, come. He said, I want to make a donation to Neha, Northeast India History Association. Let me accumulate my pay from Guwahati University and I will give you the money, which he did. He put together a check and we now have an endowment in the name of Venkata Rao. A very endearing man. He dressed very shabbily. And uh, the love of Venkata Rao was such that one winter, four or five of us at Nehu put together money to buy him a sweater. And... Uh, 
uh, the sweater was never washed, believe me, you know, and uh, slowly the sweater loosened and came down to his knees. He looked uh, pathetic in it, but uh, his heart was a lovely heart, a lovely warm heart, and we hold him close to our love and memory. How was the pan closed? On 6 May 1946, Pethic Lawrence, the Secretary of State for India, recorded a minute. The present stage, at the present stage of proceedings, agreement has been reached by the Secretary of State and the Viceroy of the impracticability of transferring responsibility for the backward tracks from the provinces to any outside authority, whether that be a British High Commissioner, Commissioner or a United Nations mandate. And it's very interesting that this uh, minute, which comes in a green note uh, sheet in the India Office Library, has a ribbon which you close that file and there is nothing more to write on it. It's as if there was a closure, not only in the record keeping, but also on the plans in the geographical space. Four months later, a question was asked in the Indian Legislative Assembly whether it was a fact that a proposal by the advisor to the governor of Assam for tribal areas was under consideration for forming a separate area to be named Northeast Frontier Agency and to be placed under the crown and not to be included in the Constitution of India. Jawaharlal Nehru, then member of external affairs, replied that there was no such proposal before government. The Secretary of State for India and Burma, Pethic Lawrence's minute of 6th May 1946, therefore sealed the fate of the Crown Colony for Northeast India with the hilly areas of Burma, including the plains of other backward areas. With Prime Minister Clement Attlee's Labour government committed to India's freedom, an enclave of a crown colony for the hill areas was not possible apart from it being ill-timed and conceived rather late to enable it to take shape. Moreover, the motives underlying it would have been grossly suspected by the new Indian leadership. The British plan for the hill areas was either, was either shelved or ignored, if not set aside by the new Assam leaders. Council had been carefully prepared by those who had left and quickly ignored by those in authority after 1947. As for the Hill people and leaders, their views mattered little. Their views mattered little. Nobody was bothered about the Hill area people. Events after 1950 were to show just how understanding India's former administrators had been towards Northeast India. Kublai. Kublai is a one word which means Kurku Ublai, God be with you. Whenever we meet for the first time, we say Kublai, and when we finish a discussion like this and depart, we say Kublai. So I've given you my blessings in Kublai, which is a Kasi word. We can now have a discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor David, for that really in engaging and um, very layered discussion. I think uh, it just comes back to my point, which I had begun with saying that uh, if we are seeing Northeast in the news today and the most of the knee jerk reactions that we often, that most of the, either from the political spectrum or from the social spectrum that people often give, it's often because of a lack of un understanding and a lack of, I would add empathy for that region. Um, and what these four plans actually highlight is that in some very weird manner, the colonial uh, rulers did have a sense of the very complex sociological understanding of that particular region in terms of uh, the tribal realities, in terms of the land holding patterns, in terms of the cultural racial um, differences from the uh, quote unquote mainland India. And what the post-colonial regimes have often failed to understand is that in terms of policy, in terms of approach in the last 70 years, there has been a real lack of understanding. So I just wanted to, uh, first of all, uh, get your thoughts as to 
how did you come about even in inquiring about these uh, these four plants and what was your motive to sort of put them together and how like what what like what was your method in terms of putting these four plants together the motive for bringing the four plants was to provide the sources for people's understanding of what the events were in 1941 to 1946 numerous misconceptions were there on these plans and uh, by putting them together in on the edge of empire as four uh, plans uh, i still prefer the original plans when you read my note which is uh, which has just been presented i quote these plans as if they were part of my work because i'm quoting it in my book because the plans uh, you you have to you have to locate the plans uh, in its original form, and the original forms are in archives, for which it becomes difficult to go to, and therefore I've included them in this. All the misconceptions are numerous. They uh, also one finds tremendous details uh, by the anthropologists like J James Mills, and these details could be used to great fruition by scholars such as those in this university in the Northeast and in JNU and elsewhere. So it's to provide information that I brought this together. Uh, it was a long and arduous uh, search. Let me tell you that the introduction goes into a long account, not only on the four plans, but the fallout of the plans in the integration of the hills of the Northeast into independent India and the uh, being linked up with Assam. So uh, the, the references are numerous, the footnotes are numerous, and it would be interesting for scholars to take a lead in my, if not in my note, but the footnotes from where the sources have come from. Uh, because I've been very careful in locating material in libraries all around and these could be put to good use by young scholars such as those in this university. So um, just to follow up to that, um, I, I just want to circle back to uh, the contemporary socio-political understanding of the North Northeast. And much of that seems to be stemming from what uh, you just discussed here in terms of excluded and partially excluded areas, which has been in the post-colonial uh, Lingua Franca turned being turned into the fifth and the sixth schedule areas. So, do, do you feel that um, had these plans? I mean, this is a sort of a sort of a speculative question. Do you feel that had these plans been seriously considered by the post-colonial regime, you would have a more um, uh, you know sensitive approach towards the region within the am ambit of the dominion of of India? Not necessarily, because uh, the Bordeloi Committee and the subsequent plans uh, of the government of India, the five-year plans, has put together the provision of the hill people looking after their own administration. In 1952, uh, many district councils were put in place, and they began to function. Not that they are functioning in the best form. Uh, they, they're really poorly administered, but an advantage was given to them by, by the Constitution of India to administer themselves and their participation in the larger body, body politic. Before 1947, they had very little representation in the uh, Assam legislature. Uh, and it's very interesting to find that uh, from the hill areas, two clergymen were uh, members of the Assam Legislative Assembly. Uh, I do remember some reading somewhere uh, that uh, by the act of 1917, there was a representation of one of the tribal uh, chiefs in the Assam Legislative Council. And he, he could very often be seen on the boat going up the river Brahmaputra, pretending to read a newspaper to indicate that he was literate enough. And on close examination, the newspaper was upside down. Uh, uh, such were the people that uh, the British put in. But after 1952, you do find uh, educated uh, uh, members of the Legislative Assembly 
and developments taking place from 1952 onwards, whether it be for the statehood of Nagaland in the early 1960s, the formation of Meghalaya, and the state's reorganization in 1971. These were all uh, developments that came with the Indian administration. So the Indian administration, and particularly the center, uh, we have noted that uh, the last of the plans by uh, Adams talks about a central, the role of the center in the development of the hill people of Northeast India. And this does take place soon after the independence of India with the constitution of India taking an interest in the administration and bringing about some reforms. Okay, um, I'll open up the questions to the audience at this point. So if anyone has any, any questions, please feel free to raise your questions. Nishant? Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. It was very interesting um, to see the uh, the plans, and you know, in some sense, uh, it tells us what could have been, but then also uh, we can also draw out what was, you know, how they influenced what happened afterwards. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask about you know, in in the latter respect. Uh, so people like, of course, then Verrier Elwin and others also made up uh, these plans. And then there were later plans for the entire, uh, you know, tribal, you know, this concept of the tribe later in the schedules and everything. So I was wondering how much of these notes uh, uh, or the, the thinking behind some of these were then reflected in say, Verrier Elwin's plan or when, you know, they were, uh, the constitution was coming up with uh, these ideas for how to govern both Northeast and also tribal areas in general um, within the, the union. So, uh, yeah. Please note that Verrier Elwin did not advise for the entire Northeast. He advised only for Arunachal Pradesh only for Arunachal Pradesh. He was the advisor only for Arunachal. And a lot of work has been done on him recently, and much more should come out. Very interestingly, all three sons of Barry Elwin from Leela were with me in college in Shillong in 19, between 1971 and 1974. But very sadly, none of the three, uh, neither of the three, have followed in the father's footsteps. And I just wonder where the documentation will go now. So when I return, hopefully we'll make inquiries of where the photographs, he's got a marvelous collection of photographs uh, of the tribes of uh, central India, uh, Madhya Pradesh, as also on Arunachal and the Nagas, and also his collection of writings. He was a prolific writer, as we know. So, uh, Elwin preferred a closed-door policy with the tribals, uh, more like the museum pieces uh, that some of these writers did not want them to be. He want, they, he, they wanted these tribes to be administering themselves and not to be closed up, whereas Elwin had a different policy when he became advisor. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your talk, sir. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, my qu question is, uh, in your presentation, you uh, mentioned about how there is a focus on the role of the center and uh, and and later in uh, terms of responding to Professor Ash's uh, uh, question, you talked about the uh, sixth schedule or the 
self governing policies so uh, it's kind of related to what professor ashish already asked so i my i was wondering uh, this uh, the role of the center in the contemporary time and uh, if, if say for example if i look at karbiang long or dimaha sao uh, even if there is a shift schedule existence but the but the administration is always trapped with the less of funding or it becomes like a with no agency sort of a administration uh, which is trapped in between the state assam state government and the central so uh, how do you see a chronology or a link uh, with the historical writing in the, uh, this place is specific to i'm more concerned in, in terms of the six schedule area in assam uh, how do you see a link of how is it been written earlier and uh, its effect in the contemporary time thank you the mikir hills and the dimasa north kachar hills were administered differently one area was partially excluded area and the other one was a backward area but in 1950 by the constitution of india they both come under the six schedule and uh, administered with district councils one of the problems with the establishment of district councils in 1952 the first set of district councils in 1952 they had very limited power very limited functions it is only after the gurkha land and the boro land uh, demand for governance that they were given special privilege and increased uh, administrative roles and therefore there there needs to be a review of the duties and the functions of these deputy uh, district councils they are in in a bad shape uh, financially they they don't have the resources to raise up sufficient revenue for their administration and are dependent on the states and uh, uh, i've not done much study on miki hills in the karbiang long area uh, i hope to do something when i go there in, in november this year on a lecture note and uh, to go to the deputy commissioner's office and find out that's one area i've not been to it but uh, generally uh, i may say that the district councils are not functioning too well in 1971 when Aru, when mizoram became a state they did away with the deputy uh, district councils they were merged with the state government and uh, uh, this you do not find happening in assam and in the meghalaya uh, district councils thank you very much um just thinking about the crown uh, colonies and the later plans that you discussed there is a you know a i think a fundamental difference between the crown colonies and what they proposed that whole idea reads idea and what he proposed and the subsequent plans because the crown plan, uh, colonies are talking about having um, you know an independent unit which would be remotely administered and under the you know uh, as a as a sort of um, what do you call it the sphere of influence of britain and um, would act Uh, not in the interests of india but you know elsewhere and the subsequent plans however uh, that you talk about are talking about a certain kind of a separation between hills and plains keeping inside the uh, keeping in mind the interests of the hills and the fact that the plains and the hills having um, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, different kinds of cultural uh, positions and uh, heterogeneity would not be advisable to uh, uh, to be kept together the something like that so so there is a difference between the different uh, plans that um uh, that were presented so this is one um uh, thought that i had in mind the second which follows from is it is that despite the fact that there is um, a a proposal for separation of hills and plains which is happening subsequently as all of these um, uh, regions are coming out of assam and demanding statehood um it is very surprising that there is no um expression of interest in these plans from within the hills 
kill people themselves. Now, you you mentioned the fact that uh, the people were not consulted, but then apart from FISO, uh, there, there is no other um, person who can be called, uh, you know, sort of kind of a, a, a dominant figure in the hills. You know, there's no Laldinga there. FISO is very, very, um, uh, FISO is supporting Japan, helping Japan. He's He has his reservations also about the crown colonies. He's not quite sure what he wants. And uh, Meghalaya, you have the different CMs and all. So there's no real um, central figure who can, you know, represent the people in the hills at that time. It's also a lot more... Uh, <clears throat> It's, it's, it's kind of diffuse, the situation uh, out in the hills. But what really surprises me is that this, uh, whatever it is, there's no expression of interest in, um, you know, in supporting the, the, the British or whatever plans that the various officers were coming up with. There's intense rebellion against the British in the hills, um, uh, uh, despite a lot of things, you know, irrespective of Christianity, irrespective of all Lushai Hills or the Naga Hills, or there's no love lost between the British and there. So that really kind of um, uh, surprises me. The dissent really comes out later against Assam, you know, the domination imposition of Assamese language and all that. So what really is happening here is would be my, it's a little uh, scattered, I know. I'm just trying to sort of, uh, you know, sort of consolidate all of this in the form of a question, but I'm, you know, um, to sum it all up, what I mean is that there are some very interesting plans that are being circulated. Um, uh, one of which is that there should be a separation between hills and plains. Notwithstanding this, you do not have a strong support towards these proposals coming from within the hills. Even FISO is you know, not very sure of where he stands at this point. So, and FISO is the only central figure that we can see for the pre-colonial period in the Naga Hills. I'm saying that you do not have such a dominant figure in the other parts. Uh, but nevertheless, we do not really have much support for any of these plans anywhere. So this is, this is why is that so? Political activity came into the hills of Northeast India very, very late. Uh, in 1946 only, the Garos were organized and the Lushais were organized at about that time. The Khasis in 1923 were brought together in the Khasi National Dilbar. Uh, and as I've already mentioned, it's odd that two uh, church people were members of the Legislative Assembly. Uh, and I'm sure that they were not very active other than Nichols Roy. Please note that Nichols Roy was the most prominent of the mm. politicians at that time, even though he was a clergyman. Uh, he was a businessman, a clergyman, a politician, and he was a, a, a very fine writer too. Uh, his collections have been brought out recently in Khasi and in English, and his thoughts are immense. But uh, uh, there was very little public support. I mentioned the Garus three Garus uh, writing a memoranda. So you do get these little snippets of opposition or support. And uh, it was generally not a large, large one as Reed would have wanted because it never percolated down to the people. And that was one of the failures by the Crown Part. But more than that, I think it was ill-timed. It was just not brought out at the right time. There is a note in the India Office Library that were these plans brought in 1930, perhaps they would have taken shape if they were brought in early in 1930. But then- Why is that so? Because, because the, the Government of India Act was to be implemented after the uh, Statutory Commission report. The Indian Statutory Commission report 1928 to 1930 uh, called for a reorganization of India's constitutional framework and then the Government of India Act 1935 came into operation. So if it would have been brought as early as 1930, then perhaps it could have been. This is just one stray idea that I noted. You know, but Professor Simley, um, what really strikes me as interesting is the fact that despite inner line, despite all this empathy with the hills, and, um, you know, I uh, take my cue from Ashish's comment that probably in the uh, colonial period, there's more empathy towards the hills than in the post-colonial times. You know, what strikes me is that political activity in the hills, which is anti-colonial resistance, although not in an organized form, is happening way early. 
you know, if you take Tirot Singh, if you take many other figures who are, you know, vehemently protesting against British, you know, intrusion, um, despite inner line, this doesn't stop because there are predatory raids into the hills, etc. So there's no love loss between the British government, whether or not, what I'm trying to say is that whether or not the hills people, organized or not organized, uh, wanted separation from the plains of Assam, they definitely did not want anything to do with the British government at that point, because there is evidence of a very serious anti-colonial resistance in the hills for whatever the reasons. And initially, so that's initially that's even pre-national yes. movement and uh, nationalism and all it that. Not, it does not continue into much of colonial time. It was only in the initial years of their annexation. It does not continue into the latest phase. Maybe because administration comes in the force of law, the impact of a new faith, uh, which many of the tribes accept, these were changes that make them rather uh, ex accept British rule rather than to resist. Okay, we'll, we, we can talk about Stop. this later. Thank you very much. And There's uh, one question from Ajay Chakrabarti. Um, is it not that far from the very beginning? Uh, is it not that from the very beginning of British Crown, they just wanted to get a road to reach Burma through Assam and the Northeast frontier, and they had little or no civilization or Christianization policy? I've not seen any reference to the construction of a road. Uh, there was no reference to the construction of a road. Because if you know the boundary between uh, Burma and India, it's a very mountainous uh, region. And uh, even today, uh, there is very little communication other than the frontier outposts in Manipur and one in Nagaland. As for, they had little or no civilization and Christianizing policy. In fact, uh, it's amazing to find that none of the four plans which I've made reference to make very much reference to the impact of Christianity or a desire to spread the word like the missionaries do. Uh, they were very particular as uh, administrators to keep away from making comments in their notes on uh, the impact of Christianity. Though they, in other references, are rather critical as I have noted elsewhere in a publication on the impact of Christianity on the tribes of Northeast. Uh, but the during the war, you have the Stillwell Road. You have the Stillwell Road. Uh -huh. But that must have had economic uh, reasons for it and, and also some strategic reasons for it. Sujeep Barua, how can we contextualize the current interstate boundary issues in the, in the Northeastern region with the colonial line system? as the demands for redrawing the boundary in the Northeast region, for example, the demand for greater Nagalim has its viability in the colonial administrative arrangements. Yes, the uh, boundaries of Northeast India have taken a tribal context, whether it's the Nagaland, uh, but there are issues there because the Nagas are living in other parts of, us, of the Northeast too, as also in Burma. So, uh, Similar is the situation with the, the Mizos. They got the state road, uh, but recently, and uh, they are also scattered in very many parts of Northeast, including uh, 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 tribes akin to them uh, are in Manipur and also in Burma. These are very, cr very difficult issues to form. And uh, I'm, I'm not really 
uh, very fluent in, in the boundary issues. Uh, I go to 1946, 1947, and I find I don't have the material enough to make comments as has been raised by this question. I think, um, are there any final questions from the audience here? Um, if not, thank you. Uh, so if not, I think uh, I would like to draw this wonderful session to a close. And I think it was wonderful to have you here in person and to in engage on this very less, on this very little known, but very Im impactful policy document that continues to shape um, at least much of the imaginations that people have regarding the Northeast. So on that note, I, um, I on behalf of the Humanities and Social Sciences Department, um, extend a, a warm note of gratitude and thank you and Kublai to Professor David. And we hope to have further discussions with you in the future. Uh, so I would like all of us to join and give him a round of applause.